Okay, I'm going to start by talking about my name, Jonah. About five years after I was born, my mom decided she would look up the meaning of my name in the dictionary. Probably should have done that earlier. And she was kind of shocked at what she found. This is what the dictionary says Jonah means. Um, and of course, it was a little bit too late at that point to change my name, although she said she seriously considered it. And later, she would tell me the story that went with this, because this meaning comes from the Bible, from the Old Testament. It's the story of Jonah, a man that God taps to go to the city of Nineveh and tell the people there to stop sinning or else. Now, Jonah doesn't much like this assignment, and he thinks he's smarter than God, so he jumps on a ship sailing far away, and God gets angry, as God always does in the Old Testament, and he sends a storm after Jonah's ship, and the boat is flying and capsizing in the water, and the sailors on board are terrified. And they're pretty clever, too, because they think that maybe they can figure out why this storm is upon them. So they draw straws, and Jonah draws the short straw. They find out that Jonah is the one who's bringing them bad luck. That's the name. So they throw him overboard, and he's quickly swallowed by a giant fish or a whale. It's in the belly of this beast that Jonah realizes he's been wrong and he begs for forgiveness. God spits him out of the belly of the beast. He goes to Nineveh, tells him to stop sinning. Immediately they say, great, we'll stop sinning. I, I don't understand that part of the story that much, but now Jonah is a prophet. So bringer of bad luck and a prophet. Um, that didn't make it into the dictionary, I don't know why. Anyway, so Jonah's story follows a very common pattern of storytelling. Uh, that we see across cultures and times. And it's shaped kind of like this. It starts out with our hero around here living a normal life, going along, everything's fine, and then one day something changes, something happens right around here that changes that person's life forever. And at first, that leads to a higher level of satisfaction and joy, Jonah outsmarting God for a moment, it really works for him. But usually when we're up here at this higher level, we're actually standing on a cliff because the next step is to fall into the belly of the beast. And in many stories, that takes different forms, but we often call it the belly of the beast based on the Jonah story. It's from here that the hero has two choices, to stick with their sense of self and their ego and to wallow in the belly of the beast or to gather what they've learned from this strange adventure change their ways, rewrite their story and their identity, and come to a higher ground. Now, this turned out to be my story, too, in so many ways. When I was 24 years old, my best friend and I started a social marketing company in 1999. There was this new thing called the Internet, and we had this great idea that if people had the opportunity to share the things that they cared about most, they wouldn't just share stories about cheeseburgers and sneakers, they would talk about human rights, they would talk about the environment, they would talk about the things that were closest to their hearts. I thought that perhaps the internet would make the world a sort of global utopia. Um, I was wrong. But it worked for a little while up around here. Um, we were this highly creative and fun uh, company. We were doing something that had never been done before. We made stuff like this, um, Darth Tater, Luke uh, Cuke Skywalker, Chew Broccoli, uh. <laughs> uh, and in the days before YouTube, 20 million people learned about organic food from this silly little vegetable puppet movie we made. Um, anyway, I could talk about that all day, but I won't. So uh, we made this film, The Story of Stuff, a 20-minute viral video that told you where your consumer goods came from and where they went when you threw them away. And even more than 20 million people watched that. It made it into classrooms around the world, and we were having so much fun. It was around that time that I felt this pressure to explain why certain things were great successes and why certain things tended to fail. And at that time, I discovered that the trick was in the power of storytelling. And so I wrote a book about it, and I began to be an expert, self-proclaimed and then proclaimed by the world as an expert in storytelling. And it was then that the business grew from two to 40 people, and it was also then that I started having a lot more answers than questions. 
And I started feeling this fear and anxiety as the business grew that we wouldn't be able to keep up. So I made all kinds of rules and methodologies, and as new people would come on board, I'd teach them the rules, and people below in the organizational structure would teach them the rules too. And before long, we were churning out film after film and campaign after campaign. But deep down, I could sense something was wrong. We were still growing, but once joyful collaborators were starting to argue with each other about who knew the methodology better. We were disciplining our clients when they didn't understand the right way to tell stories. And I was starting to feel heartbroken because all the joy and the fun was leaving the building. Every day I'd go to work believing that today I was going to change, but every day I was so busy that I found myself doing the exact same thing. And so I quickly found myself here in the belly of the beast. But climbing up didn't prove to be very easy. I didn't have the skills or the time or the ability to climb back to a higher state. And so I went on a quest to talk to everybody I could that I saw out in the world who had changed themselves and to ask them how they had done it where I was failing and to read as much science as I possibly could to uncover the secrets of how people change when they need it most. And I discovered a number of things that I want to share with you today from this quest to rewrite my own story. So the first thing I want to share with you is that I had made a terrible mistake in building this company because when someone would walk into our office to apply for the job, the first thing we want to find out is, are you one of us? Do you share our values? Do you care about human rights? Do you care about the environment? Do you believe what we believe? But I would learn that spending too much time with people who share your perspective actually limits and stunts your creativity. So I first read this amazing study in which they asked teachers, what do you how important do you think it is to teach creativity in your classroom? And teachers said that was the number one thing that they must teach to their students. Then they asked teachers to rate their favorite and least favorite students in the class. The least favorite students were always the ones who were most creative, and the favorite students were scored as the least creative. So they wanted to teach creativity, but both teachers and students didn't like the creative students in the class. That's because creativity is disruptive. It makes us feel uncomfortable. It gets in the way of efficiency. And so when we hire people or build our teams or our collaborators around people who share our beliefs, we feel great and we make really boring stuff. It's a huge mistake. So the trick is to be aware of those who share your values. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't surround your yourself with people that you love. Agreeableness is great. It's just bad for creativity. Studies have shown that cognitive diversity, the amount of difference between life experience, values, and perspectives, often predicts far more than experience or expertise the creativity of a group. I want to tell you a quick story about one of the most extreme cases of this that I've ever seen. There's a man named Jeffrey Brown. He was a preacher in Boston, and he came to Boston because he wanted to eventually be a televangelist. I don't know if you guys know what that means. Uh, you know, he wanted to have 10,000 people in his church, and he wanted to be on TV and get rich. But he had to start in this little church where no one was coming. Couldn't figure out why until it became clear that his neighborhood had the most murders in the city of Boston. There were gangs on the streets, kids were dying every day, and no one came to his church. So Brown's first idea was that he would work with the at-risk youth. He would keep them out of the gang. So he tried to pull them to his church, and none of them would come. And then one night, at two in the morning, a young man was walking by Brown's church, and he was mugged for his jacket. He gave the muggers his jacket, but he was shot anyway. And he crawled to the steps of the church, where ultimately he died. And at that moment, Brown realized that even if he had been there, able to get to the door, nothing would have happened because Brown was not there at 2 a.m. And he realized he had never actually been on these streets in the middle of the night where these killings were happening. And so what Brown did was he went with a couple of other reverends or ministers and walked around that night. And he didn't meet the at-risk youth. He met the gang members, the kids who were doing the killing. These were people he had judged to be his greatest enemies. He asked them what they thought was going on, and they immediately knew what was happening on the streets and why the killing was so out of control. Brown began to work with them, putting his judgment aside. He brought the police in, the mayor's office, and they brought murder rates down in that neighborhood 
The work that they did became known as the Boston Miracle, and murder rates across Boston dropped by 66% because people became willing to collaborate with their enemies. Now, when I first heard this, I had this great idea. I was going to go on Facebook and uh, read all of the conservative posts I possibly could and broaden my horizons. Now, I found when I did that, I just became more self-righteous. I just thought of all the reasons that those posts were crazy and wrong. And I would later learn that doing this on the internet doesn't work. Exposing yourself to the other side through a screen just makes us more sure of our own beliefs. But sitting down across from someone who does not share your perspective, who disagrees with you, who is against you, who criticizes you, makes you more creative and makes you smarter. Not because you convince each other to change your mind, but because it breaks your thought patterns and makes you have to see things from a different perspective. And so if you're an artist and you're showing your work to people who are coming from the same perspective, if you're a creator or a designer, a journalist, you might be hearing what you want to hear, but you're not learning what the world is really about. And so I learned that those who share our values, in fact, hold back our creativity. And one, is one of the deepest mistakes that I was making in building my company. Okay, the second one is connected to this strange stat. 92% of American drivers believe that they are better than average as drivers. <laughs> Then these same researchers went and found drivers who were laid up in the hospital because they had just caused an accident. 70% of them also said they were better than average drivers. There's something called the better than average effect, which makes us believe that we are all a little bit superior. And it's actually psychologically adaptive. It keeps us you know, able to go out into the world and feel good about ourselves. But when it comes to knowledge, the more that we think we know, the stupider we become. Being an expert can make you really stupid. So I spoke to this researcher, Philip Tetlock, and he did this amazing study of experts. He looked at 200 experts over 20 years. He got tens of thousands of predictions about the future, about wars, about famines, about political changes. You know how these experts did? they were worse than dart-throwing monkeys at picking what was going to happen in the future. And at first, I was like, that is not even possible. You would have to work hard to be worse than dart-throwing monkeys. But he explained to me that this is not the case. He told me there's something called entrenchment, which goes something like this. If you want to be innovative and be creative in your field, you've got to know something about it. You've got to know what's been tried before, what works, what the conversation's all about, what the technology is. And so as we gain expertise, we become more creative, right? But then at a certain point, we flatten out, and then we start to drop off precipitously. He calls this point entrenchment, and he told me the entrenchment begins when we start to attach our egos to what we know. So essentially, when we become, begin to believe that we are experts, we start to become blind to reality. Now, a chess player, for instance, will become more and more expert the more they play the game, because they're on a two-dimensional board, and the rules never change. But in an ambiguous world that's always changing, the more we believe we know, the more we take in new information and say, oh, that's just a new flavor of an old problem, or some information begins to threaten us because our ego is attached to believing it's not true. And so these experts that Tetlock looked at were so attached to their way of seeing the world that they processed every change as not a change at all and kept predicting the same thing would happen as happened in the 1970s when they wrote their doctoral dissertation, and they got stuck. He told me, in fact, that people who were featured on the news in big newspapers and on TV were the most blind to what was happening in the future. And so I asked him, you know, what do we do? Do we just remain beginners our whole lives? And he said, no. It's just a matter of stopping thinking of yourself as an expert and see yourself as an explorer, someone who is passionate about knowledge and facts and learning, but who never thinks you've arrived. It was after talking to Tetlock that I met a fascinating guy named Vineet Nayar, who showed me sort of how to do this in action. Nayar was, a, was appointed CEO of a 56,000-person company in India. The environment around this technology company was changing very quickly because they were doing outsourcing. And at that time, Microsoft and Apple were coming into their space. He knew he needed to change the company, but he didn't know how. He actually had no idea what to do. But in India, the CEO is like an emperor who should know everything. And so Nayar got up there, and he got on stage with his big PowerPoint for the first 6,000 people he was going to speak with. And he puts up his pointer, 
But instead of turning on the PowerPoint, he turns on a big spotlight. He presses another button, and Bollywood music begins to blare. And this middle-aged, very frumpy-looking, very bad dancing guy starts shimmying and shaking on the stage, and immediately sweat is pouring off his body, and everyone in the audience is kind of scared. But Nayar goes out into the audience, and he picks people out, and he starts dancing with them. So I watched it on YouTube. I'll, I, I don't want you guys to look it up. It's really terrible. But <laughs> Nayar said from that moment, he had pulled himself down off that pedestal, and he had made a fool of himself. And he had played a somewhat obvious trick, which was to let people know, hey, you can talk to me, I'm, I'm, I'm one of you. But that wasn't the trick he was really interested in. The trick he was interested in was a trick he played on himself. He said that if he could realize that he was not an expert and never feel he had to come across as one, he could truly listen and learn. And within a few years, they had tripled revenues at the company and gotten over their crisis. And Nayar said it all started with that dance. And I think that that really illustrates a beautiful point which is if we want to be explorers, we must spend time doing things that we're terrible at. I take singing lessons, and I don't aim to get any better, which is not possible anyway. But when we do things that we're bad at, it humbles us. It makes us realize that our knowledge networks are not fixed or, or, or perfect. And it creates new neural connections that we can bring back to our areas of expertise. So all this work that I had done to give talks and get on stages like I am right now, was playing a terrible trick and fixing my mind around a single idea and was destroying my creativity. The third lesson I want to share with you today is that all of that work that I was doing to keep anxiety away from me and from my company, to make things predictable, to make them safe, was actually a mistake. Because anxiety can enhance creativity up to a point. Um, what we find is that coming into a world of change, we are always going to feel a certain amount of threat. If you're very successful, you're going to be put on bigger stages with bigger projects, and you'll feel threat. If you're failing, you're missing deadlines, or you're falling behind, you're going to feel threat. If you try something new, you feel threat. That always leads to a feeling of anxiety. Now, anxiety does something in the brain called it induces cortical arousal which gives us a little bit of adrenaline, a little bit of cortisol, it gets us moving. But our um, evolutionary biology has an interesting connection with, with cortical arousal, because our ancestors on the savanna 100,000 years ago would get cortical arousal when a lion would jump out, of, out at us, right? And you get flooded, and you close your peripheral vision, you stop digesting, and you take the most obvious possible um, course of action. You don't sit down and whiteboard 15 different things you might do with this lion, you just run away, right? So too much cortical arousal leads us into stereotypical thinking. We got to do something right now, we got to move forward. And then you wind up doing the same old thing again, which gets you more, more threat awareness. This is called the safe thinking cycle. But the problem is, we can't really avoid that anxiety. That is built in. And the more we try to avoid that anxiety, the more anxiety we tend to feel. This is called uh, experiential avoidance. And the more you try to steel yourself against a negative emotion, the stronger and stronger that emotion tends to become. And so, what can we do? The creative people I spoke to all told me the same thing about anxiety. That anxiety needs to be reframed. Think of anxiety not something to avoid or keep yourself away from, but as fuel for creativity. And teach those on your team the same thing. Because no great creative idea has ever come forth without making many people feel nervous. And if you're always taking steps to keep anxiety at bay, you're always taking steps to do the same old thing. And so what's called cognitive reframing is all about noticing when that anxiety arises and not being afraid to admit it. And when it does, to recognize, hey, we might be on the verge right now of creative breakthrough. I told a story in the book of, of Gandhi who as a young man, was afraid to get up and talk to even more than two people at any given time. He'd stand up, on a, stand up on a stage at the London Vegetarian Society, very, very low stakes, and he would open his mouth and no words would come out. He went back to India, where he was a lawyer, $10 case, tried to argue in front of the jury, couldn't say a thing. He fled to South Africa to get away from his shame, and even there, he was terribly afraid. It wasn't until he was kicked off a train for being an Indian man in a white man's seat on a train that he spent a frozen night on the platform. 
without his coat, without his bag, and he realized that every time he had dodged away from those fears, his life had become smaller and smaller and more depressing. And he promised himself in that moment, at what he calls the most creative incident of his life, that he would move towards his fears. And he obviously came out of that belly of the beast to become one of the greatest innovators of the 20th century. So I call these practices and all the others that I've discovered and don't have time to share today, um, unsafe thinking. Unsafe because they make us feel nervous. They cause us to rewrite our identities and let go of those things that are most important. Connecting with people with, val or with values, not pretending to be an expert anymore, moving towards our fears. These all feel uncomfortable and take a certain amount of reframing. But safe thinking, in a world that's always changing, is actually the most dangerous thing that we can do. It keeps us holding fast to dead ideas and keeps us stuck. Safe thinking in the story framework is trying to stay here for as long as we possibly can, refusing the risk of falling here. And in some cases, it's this fantasy that we can move from here, hop over the belly of the beast, and land back up here atop, which causes so much pain and suffering because that's not really how life tends to work. And so it's actually our willingness to step forward, even if it means falling here, where our stories must be rewritten, that determines the possible creativity that we can release. I've always spoken about and preached that stories make us who we are. They tell us what we value. They connect us to others. They are the core, the DNA of who we are. But it was through this painful and dark experience with my company that I realized that stories are who we are, but they do have to be rewritten from time to time, let go of and changed, or else we stagnate. And so I came back to my company and I started tearing down all the rules. I started hiring people that I didn't particularly like or agree with. I started um, telling people, uh, rewarding people who came up with new ideas rather than followed our old ideas. And the life started to return to the company again. And when I was done with all of that, and away from that crushing fear of losing everything I had, I realized that I was actually done with this particular story. And the company that I had run since I was 24 years old, I sold so I could sit out and start a new story. And it was then that I felt that finally I had reached some kind of higher ground out of the belly of that beast and turned that bad luck around that I had brought on myself. But in a movie or in a legend, you wind up up here and the credits roll and the hero is now at a higher state. Of course, in life, we're just back here again with our everyday selves. And so I'm sure at some point I'll be walking along and probably have a temporary victory or two and know that I'm right on the edge of falling back in. But I hope at that point to do one thing differently, which is to not hold so fast to recognize the beautiful opportunity in failure and in being in the belly of the beast, the name that my mom gave me to remind me that writing, rewriting my story is as beautiful as writing it to begin with. And so today, I think we're gonna hear amazing talks about different people who have been able to successfully do that, and I hope you'll also reflect on your own uh, story, and instead of holding too fast to it, find that excitement and motivation to rewrite it when the time is right. So thank you so much.